Hey everyone, Sangeeta here from What Is, and today we're going to be looking at a really interesting topic called respiration, also known as breathing. So let's get right to it. So breathing consists of ventilation, and this of course is the mechanism that allows air to move in and out of the lungs. So this enables gases exchange to take place that is between the air inside of the lungs and the gases actually dissolved in the blood. Now it would be more accurate to call the lungs and the associated organs the breathing system, but they're usually called the respiratory system, which can be confusing, but don't get confused. It's safe to say that anytime you hear the word respiratory, just think of it as breathing in your mind. So before we can look at the respiratory system, we need to understand the structure of the respiratory system. So the lungs are enclosed in the chest or the thorax by the ribcage and a muscular sheet of tissue that is called the diaphragm. Now as you will see, the actions of these two structures, being the thorax and the diaphragm, these are what bring about the movements of air into and out of the lungs. Now joining each rib to the next rib are two sets of muscles that are called intercostal muscles. Now, just like every other scientific word, there's a, a, a less, a more simple English word for it. In this case, intercostal muscles, costals refer to rib bones and inter means between. So the two sets of muscles that we are looking at are intercostal muscles, meaning muscles that exist between the rib bones. If you eat meat, you would have seen these intercostal muscles attached to the long bones of what we call spare ribs. And the diaphragm, it separates the contents of the thorax from the abdomen. Now it is not flat, but it's a shallow dome shape with a fibrous middle part that forms the roof of the dome and the muscular edges that form the walls. So the air passages of the lungs, they form a highly branching network. And this is why it is sometimes called the bronchial tree, because its branches just like in a tree. Now when we breathe in, air enters our nose or mouth and then passes down the windpipe or the trachea. And the trachea actually splits into two tubes that are called the bronchi one leading to each lung now each bronchus of course is the singular for bronchi each bronchus divides into smaller and smaller tubes that are called bronchioles that eventually end at microscopic air sacs which are called alveoli now it is here that gaseous exchange with the blood actually takes place so even though you know that it takes place in the lungs, now you know that specifically that area in which gases exchange takes place is called the alveoli. We will get to there shortly. Now the walls of the trachea and the bronchi, they contain rings of gristle or cartilage. Now these support the airways and keep them open when we breathe in. If your cartilage collapses for some reason, your trachea actually closes in on itself and it collapses and you obviously you'll suffocate right so the cartilage is what actually holds your windpipe open so that it allows you to breathe now these are pretty much like the rings in a vacuum cleaner hose so without them the hose would actually squash flat on itself when the cleaner sucks air in so it's a very similar concept so the inside of the thorax is separated from the lungs by two thin moist membranes that are called the pleural layers now these make up a continuous envelope around the lungs forming an airtight seal. Now between the two layers is a space that is called the pleural cavity. And this cavity is filled with a thin layer of liquid that is called pleural fluid. So you have three things there we talk about. Pleural layers, in between those are the pleural cavity, which is filled with a th the layer of liquid that is called the pleural fluid. Now this acts as a lubrication so that the surfaces of the lungs, they don't stick to the inside of the chest wall when we breathe in. Now let's look at keeping the airways clean. Now the trachea and the larger airways, they are lined with a layer of cells that have a very important role in keeping the airways clean. Now some cells in the lining, they secrete a sticky liquid that is called mucus. And this mucus is what traps particles of dirt or bacteria that actually are present when we breathe in. Now other cells are covered with tiny hair-like structures that are called cilia. Now cilia beat backwards and forwards and in this motion, this is what enables them to sweep the mucus and trap particles out towards the mouth. And it is in this way that dirt and bacteria are prevented from entering the lungs, where they may cause an infection. Now, as you'll see, one of the effects of smoking is that it destroys the cilia and it stops this protection mechanism from working properly. Now, let's look at ventilation of the lungs. Ventilation means moving air in and out of the lungs, as we saw before. 
and this requires a difference in air pressure so that the air actually moves from a place where the pressure is high to a place where the pressure is low. So it's a very similar concept to diffusion. Now ventilation depends on the fact that the thorax is an airtight cavity. So when we breathe in, we change the volume of our thorax which then alters the pressure inside of it and this difference in pressure on air is what causes air to move in and out of the lungs. Now there are two movements that bring about ventilation, those of the ribs and those of the diaphragm. Now if you put your hands on your chest and you breathe in deeply, you would actually feel your ribs moving upwards and outwards and they are moved by the intercostal muscles as we explained before and the outer external intercostals, they contract pulling the ribs up and at the same time the muscles of the diaphragm, these contract pulling the diaphragm down into a more flattened shape. Now both these movements, they increase the volume of the chest and they do cause a slight drop in pressure inside of the thorax as compared to the air outside. And it is at this point that air actually enters the lungs. Now the opposite happens when you breathe out deeply. So the external intercostals actually relax instead of contract and the internal intercostals, these will contract, pulling the ribs down and in. And at the same time, the diaphragm muscles, they relax and the diaphragm goes back to its normal dome shape. Now the volume of the thorax decreases and the pressure inside of the thorax is raised slightly above atmospheric pressure. Now this time, the difference in pressure forces air out of the lungs and exhalation is held by the fact that the lungs are elastic so that they tend to empty pretty much like a balloon. Now it's important to remember that the changes in volume and pressure during ventilation, there's a very vast difference between it and you do need to remember this. And if you have trouble understanding them, think of what happens when you use a bicycle pump. If you push the pump handle, the air in the pump is squashed, its pressure rises and it is forced out of the pump. Now if you pull on the handle, the air pressure inside of the pump falls a little and air is drawn in from the outside. So this is very similar to what happens in the lungs. In exams, a lot of students sometimes think about the lungs forcing the air in and out and that is actually really wrong. So don't think of it like that. Also, another thing that you should note is that during normal, meaning shallow breathing, the elasticity of the lungs and the weight of the ribs acting downwards is enough to cause exhalation. And the internal intercostals are only really used for deep breathing, meaning forced breathing out. So for example, when we are exercising. So now let's look at gas exchange in the alveoli. Now you can tell what is happening during gas exchange if you compare the amounts of different gases that are present in the atmospheric air as well as the air that is breathed out. Now exhaled air is also warmer than atmospheric air and this is saturated with water vapor. Now the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere varies depending of course on your weather conditions. Now clearly the lungs are absorbing oxygen into the blood and removing carbon dioxide from it. And this happens in the alveoli as you mentioned before. So to do this effectively, the alveoli must have a structure which brings the air and blood very close together over a very large surface area. Now there are very much numerous numbers of alveoli and there it has been calculated that the two lungs contain about 700 million of tiny air sacs giving a total area of pretty much 60 meters squared. And that's bigger than the floor area of an average classroom. Now viewed through a high powered microscope, the alveoli look pretty much like a bunch of grapes and they are also covered with tiny blood capillaries. So now that we have all of this information, let's just put it together now. And in the final part, let's look at what actually happens with the alveoli. So blood is pumped from the heart to the lungs and it passes through the capillaries that are around the alveoli. Now the blood has come from the respiring tissues of the body where it has given up some of its oxygen to the cells and in the process it would have gained carbon dioxide. Now we know of course carbon dioxide is a byproduct and it also is a waste product that can be very toxic if it is accumulated so it does need to be removed. Now around the lungs, the blood is separated from the air inside each alveolus by only two cell layers and the cells making up the wall of the alveolus and the capillary wall itself. Now around the lungs, the blood is separated from the air inside each alveolus by only two cell layers. These are the cells making up the wall of the alveolus and the capillary wall itself. Now this is, this is a, a distance of less than a thousandth of a millimeter when you look at it, right? Now because the air in the alveolus has a higher concentration of oxygen than the blood entering the capillary network, 
Same thing again with diffusion. Oxygen is going to diffuse from the air across the wall of the alveolus into the blood. Now at the same time, there is more carbon dioxide in the blood than there is in the air of the lungs. So this means that there is a diffusion gradient for carbon dioxide in the opposite direction. So from one to the next. Now, so carbon dioxide will basically diffuse the opposite way as oxygen. So while carbon dioxide diffuses out of the blood and into the, alveoli, the alveolus, the result is that the blood which leaves the capillaries and flows back to the heart has gained oxygen and lost carbon dioxide because it would have lost it again by the lungs, right? So the heart then pumps the blood around the body again and this is of course to supply the respiring cells. So food for thought, the thin layer of fluid lining the inside of the alveoli it actually comes from the blood and the capillaries and cells of the alveolar wall are leaky and the blood pressure pushes fluid out from the blood plasma into the alveolus. Now oxygen dissolves in this moist surface before it passes into the alveolar wall into the blood. So that's it folks, that's everything there for breathing and respiration pretty much it is the same thing so don't get confused with the names i do hope you enjoy this video please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and i will be making another video very soon but for today that's it thank you so much so so very much for watching and i'll see you guys next time